Welcome back to Swift on Sundays, folks. Uh, thank you for joining me again. Uh, we've got a lot planned for today. I've been promising you an easier project for quite a while. Uh, I'm really glad that finally this is going to be that easier project. So hopefully you'll see this thing come together real fast. Um, as always, we have a few basic house rules. Uh, one of which is if you have questions, uh, please, please, uh, if they're about the topic I'm talking about right now, ask them straight away in the chat window um, because that way I'll, I'll respond to them straight away and get on board with them and so forth. If they're about pretty much anything else, uh, Flutter versus React Native versus UI kit, uh, where do babies come from? I don't care what it is. Um, any off topic questions, you have gotta leave to the end because it causes massive disruption for me and for other watchers. So please leave off topic questions for the end, on topic ones, uh, go ahead and do straight away. Uh, so today, I promised you an easy project, and I'm going to deliver. This is definitely going to be an easy project, I promise you. Um, we're going to look at how to do um, multi-screen apps in iOS uh, 12. Now, this is um, technically old news, because uh, back in iOS 3.2, we got the UI screen dot screens property, giving me an array of screens that were connected. Because even as back as the earliest iPad, like the very first you know, chunky monkey iPad, um, we could do external screens. Problem was, of course, those things were, you remember the old iPhone cable, and then they became lightning, uh, and they weren't great, right? Because no one really had the right dongle to connect that to an external screen, or if they did, it was very rare. Sanjay, that's a great example of a question to use later on. Don't ask it now, it just throws me off. Please don't be that guy. Um, so anyway, so we, we had these hideous old uh, dongles, which no one really used, so external screens weren't really a thing. Now, of course, we have USB-C iPads, and so as a result, we now get pretty much immediate uh, ways to connect your iPads to other devices. So if you've got a USB-C screen like I do, you can plug your iPad directly into there now, and it looks fantastic uh, out of the box with almost no work required. So that's one reason why uh, multi-screen apps are going to become very important soon. Uh, of course, uh, you'll know that uh, pretty much everyone's saying, hopefully, this year, dub dub 19 we're going to see official multi-screen support from Apple in a more advanced way. And if you've used um, Safari on your iPad, you'll know it does a really good job of handling multi-screen. You, know, you can have multiple tabs uh, open, visible at the same time, each of which is the same sort of view controller being reused again and again and again. And you can pull those tabs off and, and use split screen support to uh, have two tabs side by side. Um, so they do a really good job having multi tabs, one at a time, multi tabs, two at a time, or three at a time. Uh, it looks really, really nice. Now, what I expect is going to happen is an iOS 13, or whatever Apple call the next thing, they're going to expand that to everyone. So we can do a very, very similar sort of thing. So I think uh, now is a great time to be using multi-screen, uh, particularly, I guess, also because Marzipan's coming, right? Marzipan is, in theory, three months away, two months away, when Apple announced the official version of Marzipan we can all use. I mean, that, that'd be a big thing this year, right? Marzipan all over the place. So we're going to see, hopefully, uh, lots of folks shipping iOS apps on macOS. And, of course, macOS is a natively multi-window environment. So as soon as Apple cracks that story, which will, I guess, be Marzipan 1.0 in a few months' time, uh, we'll be able to have our iOS apps running on macOS with multi-screen support. So there's lots of good reasons why we need multi-screen support in our apps. So this whole program is hopefully looking ahead to what we can do uh, either now or in the future. So that's the plan. And of course, I like to show you off with real projects. So we're going to be making a, a, uh, a markdown editor. So you can type Markdown to a text editor while you're typing, and you're going to see immediately on our external display the rendered version of that Markdown. So as you add uh, Markdown code to your stuff, you know, titles or whatever you want to around the thing, uh, links, bullet points, it'll render that immediately to finished Markdown to show off in the external screen. So someone could type away on their iPad and see the finished thing, how it's going to look live. Uh, now, of course, we want to provide some sort of back compatibility to people who have not got external screens. So we're going to modify it as well. So if you're on a, a, a wider device, like a landscape iPhone or an iPad, we'll have a left and right option as well. So you can have your text here and your rendered markdown. So we'll have external screen rendered markdown and sort of split view controller markdown as well. That's the plan. 
Uh, again, I'd re reiterate the simple rules I have. Please, please, zero harassment. I have no tolerance for harassment whatsoever. If you abuse anybody for any reason whatsoever, it's an instant lifetime ban. Please don't do that in the chat window. Uh, and again, with the questions, leave the off-topic ones to the end. Otherwise, it just throws me off and it annoys everybody. That's my, that's my entire rule set, realistically. Um, so with that, I want to try and dive in. So I'll go ahead and share my screen like that. You should see the chat window on the right there. That's you folks talking away. Hello, everybody, uh, wherever you are. Oh, Nepal, fantastic, a cool country. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go ahead and launch Xcode. Now I have Xcode 10.2, so it's Swift 5. Hopefully you do as well. Otherwise, this will be a very confusing live stream. I'll put that on my screen here so you can all see it. And I'll press Command Shift N to make a new iOS project. And it'll appear over here, there we go, boom. I'm Brazil as well. Um, so I need to go ahead and choose iOS single view app and press next. And this thing is going to be called a multi mark because it's marked down with multi screens. So, you know, that's me being vaguely clever for a change. Um, I'll press next and then create on my desktop. Boom. Okay, so there is our uh, raw project. Now, sadly, despite Xcode having built-in support for markdown rendering, which works very nicely in playgrounds and similar, uh, annoyingly, there's no actual markdown support in Foundation. Uh, I don't know why, just, there you go, live. Um, so we have to import that from somewhere else. So I'm gonna go ahead and close Xcode straight away, because we're gonna have to get a pod to do that instead. And how oh, my dog's coming straight away. Do you hear me talking in the stream? Dear me. This dog's trained. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get a, a, a Cocoa Pod to use Markdown. Don't give me the eyes. You only get snacks when someone gives you some Super Chats, dog, sorry. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna go ahead and find that on my desktop, uh, desktop, and it was called Multimark. That needs to be a lowercase CD, CD, boom. And here I'm gonna say Pod in it to get uh, Cocoa Pods up and running. Have a little think, boom, there we go. I'll open my pod file up in, ooh, text edit, cool. And I'm gonna say the pods of Multimark are going to be pod, no, lowercase p, thanks for that, pod down. Now down is one of several available markdown renderers for UIKit. I'm not gonna harass you about which one's the right one to use. Um, that one's perfectly fine. Um, there are many options. That's the one I happen to like. Anyway, I'll save that. And I will, uh, come on, you can save that single file, text edit, you can do it. Save the pod file. Okay, there we go, good, save that. Obviously I need a new Mac one of these days. Um, so now we've got down installed, I'm gonna go ahead and do pod install to yank that thing in from the internet. I'll have a little think. Yeah, don't use JavaScript core. I only use it if I really have to. Um, I use it in, uh, for doing uh, expression evaluations, nice and easy in there, for example, um, but broadly it's, it's, it's slow. Anyway, we've now got the new version of our workspace, all being well, we should see, there we are, multimark.exe workspace. I'll do xed dot to open up that in Xcode. And it'll open in this window here, there we go. And this is our new workspace with that framework installed. We can now go ahead and render markdown inside UIKit really easily. So let's have a look at our storyboard in Multimark in main.storyboard, boom. Uh, so we have right now a large empty view controller, which is fine. I'm gonna add to that a text view, boom. I'll drag that thing out here. So the user has some place they can write text to on the screen. Uh, so I'll make this thing take up all the space. Uh, now really, I don't wanna have to handle uh, notches and similar here. So I like to embed these things in a nav controller to make my life slightly easier. Let's put that nav controller. There we go. Uh, of course, let's put it down here because Xcode hates me. Boom. Okay, let's make that take up all the space available minus the nav controller. Uh, so go up there and then come down here like that. So it's pinned to the uh, leading trailing edge and top safe area and bottom container area. And I'll just add uh, pins for all those things by adding constraints to top, leading, trailing, and bottom. Boom. So I'll take up all the space on the screen, which is great. 
Um, to make your lives easier, uh, I know some folks view on small devices. I'm gonna make that font a little bit chunkier. It's 14 right now, just tiny. I'm gonna use 24 so you can see at home very comfortably. Uh, and that's going to be pretty much our entire view controller. Um, we have made a few outlets here. I'm gonna control drag from there to our view controller. So we are its delegate. And I'll make an outlet for it so we can reference it in code. I'll drag down here and say, you are my text view. Boom, okay. That's our entire first view controller done, right? This is not a complicated app. I promise you an easy week. There you go, that's your easy week. That's our entire first view controller. And that's the one they're gonna type into. And obviously when I type into that, we want to render something out with their results somewhere else on the external screen and the other half, the split view controller, wherever it is, somewhere else we're gonna render out the results of that thing. And that's our second view controller. This is also trivial. So I'll press command N, make a new Cocoa touch class. This class view view controller. I'll call it preview view controller. Press next and create. And then back in main.storyboard again, we'll design that view controller. It's also very easy. So we'll drag out a new UI view controller. UI view controller, there we go. Boom, to there. Uh, this class name is going to be our preview view controller. And we use that for its storyboard ID as well. So we can reference that in code really easily. Like that, boom. Again, this thing is going to handle the output. It's going to be another text view showing the output of the first text view. Now, when you're working with um, external screens, you've got to be really, really careful because it'll be things like, you know, you can't see it, but I've got this big LG screen right here in front of me, a USB C ultra fine thing. Uh, and it's great, it's, you know, it's wide color, it's 5K, yada, yada, yada. It is not touch. I can't touch the screen. If you try and handle touches at any point on an external screen, you will get problems. So be really careful to think which bit's editable, which bit's not editable. In this case, we're gonna drag out a text view, knowing full well that this thing is never really gonna be touched because it's designed to be an external screen. So I'll drag this thing out, and I'm gonna place this thing edge to edge, underneath the notch, underneath the title bar and time. Now, the reason this is done is because uh, on your main device, your iPad or your iPhone, whatever's driving the actual application, you're going to have the status bar attached to it showing you the, the notch, whatever's going on there. On the other device, the external screen, you won't see the time. You won't have a notch. It's a regular monitor. So you can forget about the safety area realistic for that. You want to put it underneath everything. So I'm going to place it there, taking out all that full space. And again, I'm going to pin that to all the edges so it sticks right to the edge of its available space. Boom. Okay. That's our second view controller. And obviously, it's really, really uh, easy view controller, which is fine. Now for the interesting part. We want this thing to talk to the first view controller. So uh, over in viewcontroller.swift, uh, we want to be able to say, when I type into this box, shows up on the other view controller. And this creates a few complexities here because obviously by default, if you think about it, you're carrying your iPad around or your iPhone, you know, this thing here, um, you're not connected to a screen, right? It's extremely portable. These things are designed to be take, unplugged and, and, and wandered off into the train or, or work, whatever. And you kind of come back and then you connect it. And so what happens is rather than you assuming the screen's always there, you want to listen for notifications. Is this thing available yet? Did this thing connect? Did it disconnect and so forth? I need to react appropriately. Now, cunningly, this is one of the handful of places where the simulator behaves slightly differently to actual iOS devices, which is just like, you know, yay. Um, but more on that later. So to connect these things together, we already have our main view control on the left. That's this thing here with a text view attached to it. We now have a preview view controller with another text view on the right. Uh, and I'm gonna just go ahead and actually make this thing not editable so we can't screw it up by accident. Uh, boom, like that. Uh, we also want a way to set that text view, of course. We're gonna I'll make another outlet for that thing. I'll control drag uh, from that text view down to preview controller. It shows in the wrong thing for me. Thank you very much, assistant editor. Automatic mode, please. Boom, there you go. I'll make an outlet for that too, down here. We'll call this thing output view. Oh, no, output view, no! Don't do what I did and make a mistake like that. You'll get problems. Let's try that again. Let's try output view without the typo. Output, output. 
view. There we go. Okay. So we're all ready now to make our connection. Now's the important part. That mobile thing's happening. We're going to wait for the user to connect a device and be ready to respond when that happens. So I'll go back to the regular editor, open up viewcontrol.swift. What's going to happen is we need to be ready to track additional screens being connected. They might plug in one. I guess in theory they could plug in two or three. I don't know how well that works, but in theory they could plug in several screens. We've got to track them all being connected and disconnected freely so we can work with them all. This means keeping them in RAM with a, a property that will hold on to those windows so they aren't destroyed after they're connected. So I'm going to say in our view controller, we have a property called additional windows. And this is an array of UI window. Now UI window is a really, really old school class that most folks before say iOS 5 or so would be intimately familiar with. You had to make your window by hand in ye olden stone age of iOS. Uh, now we have storyboards, we haven't got to worry about UI window nearly all the time, but it's always there. And it's a thing directly behind your view controllers. If you, all, if you had no view controllers at all, the thing you would see would be your UI window. Every app has one, but it's now more or less invisible. It's no longer invisible. We've got to track the new windows as we create them, as we create view controllers for them, and stash them away so iOS doesn't destroy them. So that's our array of windows to track for this view controller, for our main application view controller. We're now going to say in view did load, notification sensor dot default dot add observer. We're going to track an event coming in. I'm going to use the for name object Q initializer, uh, sorry, uh, method. And the name for this one is called UI screen dot did connect notification. So when a screen has been connected, we want to trigger some code. Objects nil, Q is nil, uh, nil even. And for the closure to use, what code to run when a screen's been connected? First, we're going to say weak self. So we can weakify self and then do a strong dance afterwards. This will also be given a notification. Here's what's changed. And inside there, it'll tell us, here's a new screen that was connected. What do you want to do with it? So we'll say notification in. We're being passed what actually happened. So inside there, we're going to start by doing the whole weak strong dance thing by saying, guard let self is self else return. So if for some reason self's gone away, don't do anything, don't hold on to weak uh, self, just get out of there immediately. We can now pull out the new screen we're being handed. That'll be inside this notification object being passed in. It'll say you've got a new 1080p screen being passed in, whatever it is, something's passed in there, and it's going to be a UI screen, which is an even bigger type than a UI window. That's a whole screen size thing. So we can say guard let new screen is notification to object, which is an optional any. So anything or nothing. It's really existential, that one. As question mark a UI screen else return. So if we had did connect, we should be given a screen. Make sure we have been given a screen. If we haven't for some bizarre reason, never should happen, but it's not being safe. Just bail out. Just get out of there straight away. Something's gone wrong. Just exit immediately. This will tell us. Great, you've got a new 1080p screen connected to your device. What do you want to do with it? Well, the first thing we're going to do is read out its dimensions. We'll say let screen dimensions equal new screen dot bounds. So we'll get back, you know, uh, 0x0y with 1920 height 1080 or 1280 720, whatever it is, some sort of rectangle there describing the size of the screen that's being connected. We can now say, make a new UI window that matches that size. So no matter what size screen it is, make a new window to match that thing. So we'll say, uh, let new window equals a UI window using the frame of screen dimensions, like that. And new window dot screen is our new screen. So connect the window to the screen. So the window's drawing somewhere on that screen. Now for the important part. We've got a UI screen, the monitor itself. We have a UI window, the root thing inside there to draw. We now want to say, 
put inside that window our preview view controller. So we can start having that text view on the screen and showing our rendered markdown. So we can say guard let VC is self dot storyboard question mark dot instantiate view controller with identifier. Did I put it at the clipboard? I did. Uh, preview controller. Ask question mark preview view controller. Else. So if we cannot get a preview view controller from our storyboard, disaster, something's gone hideously wrong, we'll call fatal error with the message unable to find a preview view controller. That again, that should never happen. That should just basically a debug problem realistically. I should always succeed, but there you go. If that works, if we've got our view controller, we've got our screen, we've got our window, we can now say, hey, our new window, your root view controller is that preview view controller just made. So assign that to there. So the view controller shows in the window, the window shows in the screen, the screen will appear hopefully shortly. Uh, for reasons, thanks Apple, by default, new windows are hidden. You want to say is hidden is false to show the window in question and append that to our additional windows array. New window. So it's stored. Otherwise, it'll end the scope of our observer and destroy the window straight away, which destroys the screen, which destroys the view controller. So you've got to store that away, strongly held, so the window stays alive. Now, at this point, in theory, if I go ahead and choose some sort of iPad from here, I'll do third generation, uh, press Command R, unless there are some hilarious typos, this should be slightly almost working. Let's find out. There's my iPad Air sim starting up. Uh, now, if you didn't know already, you can simulate external displays using uh, simulators. It's, it's a really good method. You can just go ahead and choose debug, uh, sorry, hardware, external displays. And there's loads of these things to choose from. Obviously, choose one that's sensible for your device. Don't go for a 4K screen unless you've got a huge screen to work with. Otherwise, you see nothing at all. Uh, let's find out. Nice big white empty screen. Come on, you can do it, iPad. Boom, there's my Lorem Ipsum text. I'll now go to uh, hardware, external displays, and I'll select uh, 720p display. Boom, that is my other view controller. You can see the font's much, much smaller over here. That's the other view controller. So it, it's at least working. There's no communication between the two, but it's at least working. We have our main view controller here and our preview view controller on the other side, all working nicely. Obviously, what we want to do is go into here and start typing, you know, uh, hello world, and have that appear on the other screen straight away as a preview. So we're gonna try and connect the two. So to do that, we're gonna go back to our preview view controller, and we'll import that down framework we had earlier, down. And we're gonna say that this preview view controller has a text string. It starts off being empty, but when it's modified, our property observer saying, great, got new text coming in, make that into markdown, render it, and put it into our output view text view. So we'll say var text is a string, empty is by default, did set property observer, let down equals down with a markdown string, which will be our text string. We can then convert that to be an attributed string by saying let attributed string equals optional try down dot two attributed string. And finally, output view dot attributed text is that attributed string. And that's all it takes to render markdown. So now for the important part. That's our text property on the preview view controller. We have to set that from our first view controller. So when it's changed, uh, our text view there, it'll update the preview view controller as well. So to do that, we're going to go back to uh, view controller Swift. This thing really, really control dragged in the storyboard to make our uh, view controller the delegate for the text view. But by default, you don't get co-completion for text view stuff unless you make your type conform to UI text view delegate. So let's do that now, delegate. And with that small change, we'll now get co-completion for text views. So we can say text did change like that, boom. And this will be cool whenever our text views text changes somehow, i.e. you've typed something into there. And what we're going to do is say, go into our additional windows property, read the first item, type cat as a preview view controller. And if that succeeds, awesome, go ahead and set its text property. 
which will then update the preview view text view, like this. Guard let preview is additional windows, uh, additional windows, dot first question mark, dot root view controller, as preview view controller, else return. So for some reason, our additional windows contains some other kind of view controller in there, fine, just bail out. Again, that shouldn't happen here, but there's no harm being safe. If we're still here, we can now say preview.text is textview.text. .text. Just pass in whatever they've typed directly to the text property, which then does a whole markdown conversion for us. I'll press Command R now, and this should actually come together, hopefully. Let's find out. Okay. Let's see if it's going to work. It's going to play ball. I'm going to write in here, hello. Oops. Hey. Hello, world. Nice. If I do some markdown, uh, hello, title. Awesome. Uh, bullet points. Uh, second bullet point and third bullet point. Awesome. Okay. That's actually coming together quite nicely. Now, you may have noticed that the uh, preview text in my preview view controller is tiny. Uh, that's because it's rendered at sort of default attributed string size font, which isn't ideal. Uh, fortunately, we can fix that. If you go back to uh, preview view controller, we can say, uh, before we modify stuff, we can say, uh, let style equals some sort of CSS to modify the way the default look and feel is. So we're going to say uh, body text is going to be font 200%. So oops, much, much larger, basically, in uh, sans serif, like that. Boom. As a result, we'll now get much, much larger uh, text styling by default. So if I say down to attributed string, with the style sheet of that style, with that small change now all being well, we should see significantly larger text in our rendered external screen. So here's our text. I'm going to say, hello world, beautiful, and a bit of title here, awesome. Let's do a link here, uh, apple.com, uh, beautiful. So we've got lovely markdown bullet uh, bullet two and bullet three. Okay, so this is now an external screen working nicely. As you can see, it's talking smoothly between this main thing and the second thing. So this is already a fairly useful app, but there's a problem. If I go ahead and say I want an external screen using uh, 1024768, I'll get that instead, and you'll see lorem ipsum appears. And if I type into here, I want bullet four or bullet five or whatever, it's doing nothing at all. It's just dead now. And it's not because it's a magic size, not working correctly. Uh, what's happened is we added our first window in our did connect uh, notification here, boom. But when we're disconnected, we didn't remove that from our additional windows property. As a result, when we say additional windows first review controller, da -da -da, it's modifying a window that's no longer actually visible anymore. It's still in the array because it's never removed. But we had a second screen now. The first one never removed. So you gotta keep in mind, like I said earlier, they're gonna connect devices freely. Plug in, plug out, plug in, plug out, as often as they want to, whenever they want to. You've got to be prepared for that eventuality. And so what we want to do really is add a second, uh, what does that mean about the iPad come from? Oh, that's the that's the text input thing for keyboard. So we're typing, that's the thing above here. It doesn't hide that by default. I've got a hardware keyboard plugged in, so it doesn't hide that. That's all you're seeing is that thing there, Robert. Anyway, so we've got to make sure we handle disconnections. Otherwise, our app is not truly portable. They're going to hit problems straight away, which is a really bad idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to say in view did load for our view controller, add a second method, a second observer, sorry, to track disconnects as well. So we'll say notification center dot default dot add observer for the name UI screen did disconnect notification. Object still nil, Q still nil. Uh, the closure attaching to this thing is going to be uh, weak self notification in just like before. We'll do the weak strong dance, guard let self is self else return. So at this point, our notification will tell us here's the old screen that's been disconnected. 
you can now go ahead and read its window and ditch that entirely. So this time we've got to do a typecast still to a UI screen, but that's going to be the old screen. So we can say guard let old screen equals notification to object as question mark UI screen else return. We want to find that screen inside our additional windows array. Now keep in mind, we've been given a UI screen, this thing here, and we have an array of UI windows, not a UI screen. So we've got to be really careful. We want to find the window inside our windows array by looking at the screen property. So to do that, we're going to use the first index where method. We'll say uh, if let window is self dot additional windows dot first index where and then a closure. We'll say where that screen is equal to the old screen we're passed in. So if we have more than one window, initial windows, we'll say, hey, is this your screen? No. Is this a screen? No. Is this a screen? Yes, it is. Fine. Use that thing. Is there a way, Smongo asks, to connect multiple external screens at once? I don't know. I don't know. It's a really good question. I only have one screen. Uh, certainly, I don't think it supports it, uh, at least not with one device. It sort of kills the other one and adds a fresh one. Um, but I guess real devices, different story. Maybe an iPad Pro, USB-C, you could daisy chain them. I really don't know, I'm afraid. Anyway, that'll find the window that owns that screen, or has that screen, sorry. So inside here, we now know which window to remove. So we can say self dot additional windows dot remove at that window index. So it'll destroy the window from the array as soon as it disconnects correctly. So in theory, now that means it'll remove old screens as they disconnect. In theory, let's find out. So I'll type in here, uh, hello world. There is my whatever screen that was, whatever that is hardware, displays, there we are. I'll say, give me a nice tiny one instead. Boom, back to that again, and yet. So it's now working correctly. If I have another screen again, let's do a 72480 screen. There's Lauren Ipsum, let's do exclamation mark, boom. That's working nicely. Now there's a slight hiccup here, as you can see. When you first connect a screen, it goes back to default text. Really, we want to update straight away as soon as it connects. And we can do that by saying, in our did connect notification, we can just call our text view did change method straight away. We can say self dot text view did change uh, with self dot text view. So trigger that updating code immediately as soon as the screen connects. And now being well, that means we should never really see the Lauren Ipsum text. It'll update straight away to the correct text. Let's find out. I'll type in here, hello Swift. There's our screen. I'll say you are now going to be a tiny screen. Boom, hello Swift. There we go looking nice. Different screen. Yeah, okay. That is looking much, much better. Okay. Uh, there, are, there is one further situation which I mentioned earlier, uh, and this is problematic because it's dealt with differently. I can't show you this uh, here. Um, the simulator deals with this differently. The official documentation says when your app launches, like when it first launches on a, a device, if the screen was already plugged in, you will not get sent a did connect notification. That's what the documentation says. Uh, now, here you can see I clearly am because it launches and registers the screen straight away and renders it nicely. So clearly it's working for me in the simulator, but in devices, the Apple state will not happen. You gotta check UI screen dot screens by hand and update them automatically. That's fine, just, just, just do an extra check when your app launches. Otherwise, you'll be fine. Anyway, at this point, we have external screens working. We're only be going in like 30 ish minutes. External screens work nicely. Um, it's actually rendering correctly. This is actually a fairly usable application for doing external screens. What would I ideally like to get to, of course, is to have this with a nice backup so we can also have it working as an iPad to have sort of a, a split screen of typing and the preview on the other side. So you can have both. So if you have an external screen, awesome, you'll see it there. If you haven't, you'll still see it here. So you can still work with uh, a, a preview for your Markdown renderer. Uh, question from Boki Rocky or Bokai Roki, and I pronounce it. Where's the doggo? Doggo did not get any treats. Um, I have a standing rule that she only gets treats when someone does a super chat. Uh, and she came in, got no treats, and wandered off again. But if I shake the bag, someone gives a super treat, a super chat, she'll be here straight away, I'm sure. She's very good at listening for the bag sound. She's a very highly trained dog for treats. Anyway, 
Let's take this app a step further as fast as we can to make it work as a great iPad decision, even when there are no external screens. But before I do that, before I do that, you've seen already a half working app here. This kind of came together nicely doing Markdown rendering live and external screens. If you're enjoying these streams, if you like these streams, want to see more of these streams, please, please, please leave a like for the video on YouTube. That helps YouTube recommend videos like this to other watchers. So if you're enjoying the stream, you want to see more like it, recommend other things by having a, 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 a like in the channel, a like for the uh, video. It'd be most appreciated indeed. Thank you very much. Please like the video. Anyway, advert over. Um, let's go ahead and make this thing work with a left-right split as well as the external screen. So, in Xcode. Um, oh, okay, for, uh, poor Luna, <laughs> says David. Poor Luna, all right. Let's see how fast the dog comes. If I rustle the bag a little bit, will she hear that and come? Let's find out. Oh, she could be sleeping downstairs, you know. <sighs> Dog's gonna go hungry. If I give her a, if I call the dog. <sighs> hey, you know, this week, this week is the week we are dog sitting another dog. Uh, so that might become two dogs soon. Uh, we'll find out soon enough. Oh, she's not coming back. I'll try and shout for her without getting into the microphone. Luna! Let's find out if she comes with that. If she doesn't come, she's probably broken into some food cupboard downstairs while I've been chatting. She's a very clever dog, it turns out. Anyway, let's go and go to uh, main.storyboard. Oh, here she is. There you go. You made it. Come on then. Come say hello. Come on. Come here. Oh. What? <laughs> She's recently figured out how to get into the uh, cat's uh, cat food thing while the cat's eating the cat's cat food. And she's acquired a bit of a tummy now, um, I think, from all the cat food. So we're, we're rationing the treats just slightly. She only allowed posh dog treats right now to avoid the cat food problem. But you may have a treat because David has given you some treat money. So, oh, go on, there you go. Good girl, well done. All right, so, good girl, and then you get, oh, good dog. All right, back to sleep for you. Anyway. Split view controller on the iPad, yes. Let's go ahead and do that now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and drag out from the object library a split view controller. Uh, these things are huge by default and really weirdly slow. Let's drag one of those things out to here. Occupies loads of space. Give me the eyes. Don't give me the eyes, give them the eyes. <laughs> they'll, they'll feed you. Anyway, that's gonna be our split view controller. And it comes with stacks of stuff by default. We don't really want all this stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, delete this view controller here. You can go away, you can go away, and you can go away, and you can go away, and you can go away. Boom. So we're left with basically a raw split view controller doing nothing at all. What we want to do is connect that. So it's master view is going to be our editing view. So the thing on the left, the thing you type into. So I'll just control drag from there to our existing navigation controller and choose master view controller from there, like that. And then for the right hand view, the other side, we see the live preview of what's going on, that's gonna be our preview view controller. But of course, we don't want really want to have um, a, a mismatch in navigation bar heights and so forth. You want a nice smooth navigation bar across the whole way. So what we're going to do is embed this thing, our preview view controller into a navigation controller. So editor, embed in, navigation controller. Now, importantly, this matters. This thing is still called our preview view controller. That still has the storyboard ID preview view controller. What it means is when we create one of those in code for our external screen, it will still make one of these directly with no nav controller. It isn't required. There's no point in having it here because it's an external screen. But when we have it in our split view controller, we want to have that bar. So it gives us the flexibility to have both. So I'll control drag from master view controller down to our second nav controller and choose detail view controller. So the master one is the one on the left, details the one on the right. So that is our entire UI set up. We're going to make one tiny small change, which is to drag this little arrow from our nav controller up to our new split view controller. So that's what gets shown when the app first launches. 
Otherwise, it will show the wrong thing and get confused. We don't want that at all. So that's our layout done. What we have to do now is go back to viewcontrol.swift and say inside text view to change, uh, we may have an external screen, in which case update that. We may also have a detail view controller in our split view controller. We have to update that as well. We have to update both. As a result, we can no longer use guard let here. We've got to use good old if let. So if let this, we'll just do that immediately. Preview text is text view to text. But we're now slid in the method. So we can now try and read our split view controller's child to make sure, I'll get rid of the else, my mistake, to make sure we have something there to update. So we may or may not. We'll say if let nav controller equals split view controller question mark dot view controllers dot last as UI navigation controller. So if that succeeds, if we have a nav controller on the right hand side, great. Let's try and read its top view controller. We'll do if let preview is nav controller dot top view controller as question mark preview view controller. And if we're inside here, we have a nav controller on the right hand side, and inside that's a preview view controller. Awesome. We can now just say preview dot text is text view dot text. So we update first the external screen and then second the right hand side of our split view controller. I'll press command R now and we should see this is slowly coming together. External screens here. There's our split view. I'll select this text here and write in hello world. Um, make that a title so you're going to see it nice and big. Boom. Okay, that's looking really, really nice now. It's actually coming together properly. Um, there's a bit of a problem, which is that uh, we now have what Apple terms adaptive layout. Uh, we have a split view controller, uh, which looks fine, of course, works fine on iPads, but if you try and put that into, uh, say, uh, an 8 Plus, an iPhone, we hit problems. Because split view controllers look and work fine in iPhones, but in portrait, iOS needs to know how to handle the split. Because there's not enough space in this, in this portrait mode to show both sides of that by default. What do we want to do? And what you'll see is it'll get it wrong. Uh, you'll see it showing us this detail view with a back button that goes back to the master view. So it's completely backwards. We don't want that at all. We want to show that child view and only the child view by default. Uh, Bucky, um, I have I have an Instagram account, but I don't put anything on there. Um, unhelpful. Don't, don't don't tag me. It's a top question. Otherwise, it's very confusing for my brain. It just pops my brain off immediately. Anyway, um, we're gonna we're gonna fix that by having a UI split view controller delegate. Uh, now, the way Apple does this, it's not ideal. But we're gonna do it here because it's, it's already uh, quarter to seven. Um, is to make our app delegate responsible for the split view controller. And to do that, you say in your app delegate, uh, you're an app delegate, fine, but you are also a UI split view controller delegate inside there. And now in did finish logic with options, you can configure your split view to act however you want to. So we can say in here, uh, if let split is our window uh, question mark dot root view controller as a UI split view controller. So if we can get access to a split view controller for our windows root view controller, awesome. What do you want to do? In this case, we'll do split.delegate is self. So ask us how this split view controller should behave. Now, the method we have to override here is completely backwards. It's so confusing. It's called collapse secondary. This thing. Split view controller, split view controller, split view controller. Collapse secondary, secondary view controller, view controller, on primary controller, view controller returns bool. <sighs> it's all a bit John Malkovich. Um, anyway, this thing is totally confusing because it defaults to returning false. So collapse secondary returns false. And what that means is it will attempt to collapse a secondary view controller onto the primary view controller in a way that makes sense, which in iOS land means push it onto a navigation controller stack. In our case, we want to say return true. Return true, which for some, I mean, genuinely makes no sense to me whatsoever reason. It's some confusing reason. That means do nothing with the secondary view controller. Yeah, pfft, terrible bit of API there. But anyway, returning true here means toss away secondary, just stick with the primary. So I'll press Command R. Hopefully now in iPhone 8, we should see, boom, 
our primary view controller will look good on there. Now, if I go to landscape mode, you'll see we have this nice uh, split view thing going on because iPhone 8 can handle split views correctly. Um, but it's not the case for all iPhones because if I go to an iPhone 10R, uh, which for reasons is considered to be different from an iPhone 8 Plus, um, you'll see it behaves less helpfully. Let's launch our third sim of the evening. Now get a glass of wine. As our primary in landscape mode, as our secondary. Primary, <laughs> landscape mode, secondary. So it pushes the secondary onto the stack for no real reason. It's really, really unhelpful in landscape mode by default, which is not great. Um, to fix that, we have to configure our split view delegates some more. We're going to say inside um, the dimensional logical options, we're going to say uh, split dot preferred display mode is dot all visible. So even when you're on an iPhone, like an iPhone XR, I want to see these things visible all the time uh, in landscape mode. It should look a lot nicer, hopefully. Let's find out. So just primary and portrait mode and landscape, we get both. So it's working better. We're going to make one last small change. We've got 10 minutes to go. We'll make one last small change. Uh, we're going to say, uh, by default, make our editing window bigger. Now, if you look again at iPad, uh, we had iPad Air, I think. Um, for historical reasons, the default size of the primary view controller is 320 wide. That's the original size of an iPhone. So a lot of iPhone apps work great uh, out of the box with this, which is fine. Um, however, in this case, we really want to say, actually, we know what we're doing, make this thing bigger, either half the space or more than half the space, whatever the split you want to happen is. And you can do that by modifying your split views uh, preferred primary column width fraction property, where zero is invisible, one is the full width of the whole split view. In our case, we're gonna say 0.5. Now, for wonderful reasons here, wonderful, wonderful reasons, if I run that back now, you'll see literally no difference. Um, so I do it again. Boom, it's still 320 wide, even though that's the primary one, even though it said, please prefer having 0.5, it's still taking up a tiny amount of space. Uh, the reason for that is, again, thanks Apple, there's a property called the maximum primary column width. That's the maximum width of the thing on the left. And in this case, it's set to zero. So take up as little space as possible. We're gonna say, actually, we don't care how big you are, become as big as you like. Um, we can do that by saying, dot greatest finite magnitude. Take as much space as you need. What we care about is this thing here, preferred primary column width fraction. That'll take up half the space, regardless of how big the iPad is, iPad, iPad Pro, 12.9, whatever it is, or just iPhone, it'll always be half the space exactly. So now press Command R, we should get everything working correctly. Hey, it's Guy Rambo, how you doing, Guy? I, actually, I should say, uh, one of Guy's tweets does say very strongly, prepare your apps for iOS 13, for multi-windows. Anyway, there we go. Half and half looking correct. We have on the left here, uh, hello world. Uh, if I do a title here, that becomes rendered on the right full size and in our external display. So we now have multi-screen display and split view going on with two view controllers. That's a finished application as far as I'm concerned. And that is actually like eight minutes to spare. I'm actually slightly early this time, which is fantastic. I told you it was an easy project. Anyway, that finishes my main project. If you have any questions about what I just made, uh, or at this point, anything else, minus where the babies come from perhaps, uh, now is your chance to go ahead and ask in the chat window. How you disable split view when there's an external display? Good question, Robert. The problem is you don't necessarily want to disable split view automatically. You could do. You could modify this immediately to say, you know, 1.0 for your preferred column width. However, it'll, it'll, it'll jump. And having that jump is unpleasant. You want to tell folks, uh, or at least be sure a button perhaps, you know, do you want to maximize or minimize the split view uh, rather than having it uh, um, snap into place. Um, you could do that by modifying this number here. You could also just modify the preferred display mode to say um, primary hidden or automatic to modify it that way, um, whatever works to you. I'll probably modify that one there instead, but you know, it's down to you. Can I show preview.swift file? Yes, I can. That one there, presumably. 
It's really easy. That's that's down in action. It's wonderfully simple to do markdown rendering because uh, it's a, a really simple framework. Again, there are others out there you can use, but uh, <laughs> choose one works for you. If you have a question, Bucky Rocky, go ahead and ask it. Otherwise, I'm not going to scroll and find it. How does this work with multiple apps on iPad screens, slide by split view and picture in picture? Picture in picture is a separate mess, and that's done separately by Apple. We couldn't really control that too well. Um, slide over. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. That's going to be very interesting because you're going to have a problem where you are not the active app. So you wouldn't have control over the external screen. Um, so be, I guess that's down to Apple to activate who has control of the external screen. You have to plug in a USB-C iPad to a USB-C screen and see what happens there when multiple devices. The problem is you've got to try and find two apps that both use external screens. And there are so few of them right now, that could be challenging. Um, so step one, try and find two apps that work with external screens on your iPad USB-C Get that to USB-C's monitor and just see what happens. I suspect we're going to have no control over that because, you know, I, I can see that. If Apple are serious about this, if iPad iOS 13 does indeed have multi-view control, I think it's standard and tabs, it's going to be out of our control. Um, if you remember, if you've done any Mac OS stuff, um, the move to El Capitan, I forget, one of them introduced tabs. And it was absolutely beautiful because uh, if you had multi-document support in, Apple and in your app anyway, multi-window support, it automatically gained tabs, like instant overnight. There was no work required. Just hit compile, deploy, it was done. Um, now, I suspect Apple want that same trick for iOS. They don't have any hassle of us thinking, oh, am I in split view, slide over, whatever. It will be automatic. So, uh, Kushan, you've answered your own question with the word assuming. <laughs> I don't want to assume anything at all. Um, in that, I would not assume anything at this point. I would say it is UI screen dot screens and always has been. Um, I suspect it's designed to handle more than one, so I'd back away from assuming anything at this point. Do I have the S2 idea on like Air Server? I've never used Air Server, so I don't know what it does. I'm gonna get some, some, some sort of streaming thing. I don't know how it does it, I'm not sure. How to start? Ask Rock X Shotty. Um, you want to go to the 100 Days of Swift, which is hackingwithswift.com slash 100, and it will walk you through the curriculum on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, Conath. Um, May not storyboard. So we have a master view controller, a split view controller, sorry, here, which is our initial view controller. Its root view controller is the nav controller for our main view controller. It's detail view controller is a nav controller pointed to our preview view controller. That's the entire setup there. Um, the key is this thing here, the second nav controller, never gets used if we are uh, connecting screens. We don't want to have that external screen. We create a preview view controller in, in, by itself individually and use that for the external screen. It's a much, much nicer way of working. Um, Manuel, it's currently not possible to dig in at the view controller because it's the only view controller in the app. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. Can I show a toggle hide and show of master view controller? Um, the problem is I've made it be all always visible, so I know I can't. Um, if this were dot um, primary overlay, uh, then it would do a whole slide in slide out thing, uh, which is probably not what you want here. Uh, I suspect it's not what you want. Uh, the, honestly, the best thing to do. Uh, I say that, say that very carefully, is to make a new project and choose from the template area, choose a master detail application, because you'll get Apple's recommended implementation of split view controllers in there. So if I jump into that quickly, uh, you will see all sorts of code in here. Like I said, they make the thing handle the uh, delegation that of the uh, split view controller, which is fine and they have methods down here for doing collapse and secondary and so forth. But you'll notice they have detail items being used. And that's the button that lets it toggle between full screen and not full screen. Um, you can use that if you want to. Um, it's not ideal code. I mean, I think some of the horrors they have in here, like this kind of thing, it's just grim source code, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, it's Apple, um, so... Yeah, look at that. That's just nasty, nasty code. 
NS date. Ugh. Uh, anyway, so take bits from it, but don't learn from it. <laughs> Steel code, don't, don't reuse it. Uh, David, Airtel is Apple, there's Apple TV from your MacBook. I feel like you your MacBook. Cool, I've never used it, I've got no idea. No idea. It's not gonna be this kind of external screen thing I expect, I don't know, I'm guessing slightly, but I don't know. Um, not a question. Yeah, rescue time, you can see it up here, it's working away in the scenes. It keeps telling me I'm spending much, too much time um, slacking off when I'm actually just doing stuff. Okay, what's your question? Do you want to do two trolls? No, you don't want to do two trolls. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? It makes no sense. That's literally the worst thing you want to do. That's the kind of person who's going to fail at learning Swift. I want to learn faster, so I'll do two different tutorials at the same time. No, what a terrible idea. Don't do that. I'm giving you as much material as you can possibly get, completely free of charge, carefully guided, one hour a day, and there is no reason to do more than that. If you don't want to follow my stuff, fine. Follow Angela's stuff, it's awesome. I'm sure you like it very much. Don't try and do two at once, or just confuse yourself. That makes no sense. Ah, Kushan, thank you very much, very kind of you. Let's see if I can get a dog to get some more treats. <laughs> Luna! Let's see how far away she went. Ah, I think she went back downstairs again. Here she comes though, come on. Come on. Kushan, give me a treat, come on. Good girl, you're a good girl, aren't you? Yes, you are. Yeah. Dog's very grateful. Uh, what's the best way to start being a nice developer from the ground up? I've literally told the same stream multiple times. Go to hackingwithswift.com slash 100. I mean, that's all I can say again, again, again. Go to that URL. It'll link you to my current best advice of folks learning Swift from the beginning. Uh, it's video-based. There's tons of uh, reviews in there. It can't go any more than that. Stephen Poodle learning Swift, forgetting code or how to use APIs. Um, are you following my tests, Stephen? Are you using my challenges and my reviews? Because I have every time you learn something, I have a review afterwards testing your knowledge to make sure it's sunk in at least beyond shallowly. Uh, if you are not following that, please follow that. You'll find that much easier as a way of remembering stuff. Again, do the challenges. They're asking you to write your own code so you understand exactly how things work, to so extend things. If you're doing that challenges and you're doing the reviews and you're still not learning, I'm running out of ideas. Um, I would say remembering stuff is overrated. Most folks haven't got to remember stuff. We'd either use documentation or just Google stuff and find it that way. You want to remember the principles and the concepts, not the precise pieces of code. Uh, Goosewag, I've never heard of Yunnan, Mexico, sorry. Any more questions? Hi Rob, uh, you can rewind and watch later. It's a lovely simple app, I think. It's a much, much simpler than we've been making previously. Um, so we've managed to get through it in 45 slash 50 minutes. I think it's pretty good for me. I was admittedly speaking very quickly, um, but there you go. Am I taking suggestions on selling Hack and Swift books? Um, I sell them already, David. I'm not sure what you mean. I sell them across the board, so um, please buy them. <laughs> Keeps a roof over my kid's head. Helps me produce free content like this one. Um, so yes, whatever works for you, I recommend you buy it. John, um, how much of Hundred Days has changed for Swift 5? Nothing. It's all written for Swift 5. All the videos are recorded in Netcode 10.2. It's all written for Swift 5. Um, so it's all back up to date. Go ahead and follow that and you'll forget nothing at all. It's all fine. Man, I'm glad you enjoyed it very much. Um, I, this is the first, I think, well, not first, but the first easy one in a while. Um, I think I should do more easy ones. like quick, short, sharp projects, make something useful, because you can expand on this. I mean, you know, the principle here, external screens, UI split controller, you know, navigation controllers and similar. You go ahead and expand on this and sell it off um, as much as you need to. Ah, David, no, no, I, I, folks keep asking about subscriptions because they want to have a way of, you know, reading all the books more affordably, and I get that. Um, it's problematic for a number of reasons. Um, I, I'd like to do something, but I'm not sure what. Uh, I understand. You know, folks want to get the cost down, they want to learn in the long term, uh, I get that, I would love to support that. Right now I haven't got a plan, uh, so I haven't got anything other than just selling books right now. 
But I would say there's likely to be a sale at WWDC week. So that is in, what, uh, two months or so? So watch out for that. Uh, please do fast lane and CI. Uh, not going to happen, Manjanus, I'm sorry, um, because it's not an application. Right now, we are focusing entirely on building applications in Swift from scratch. That will change at some point. We'll switch across to doing techniques or something else. Right now, it's building apps and games from scratch in Swift. So folks can see nothing become something useful, in this case, a Markdown editor in, in iPad. Um, so uh, I would rather stick with that for a while longer, probably the next 12 projects or so. This is actually number 12 already. Probably like 13 through 24, we'll do the same thing. And then after that, we might do um, more general techniques and similar. Uh, a discount. Honestly, David, if you subscribe to my newsletter, you will get the best discounts I have emailed to your inbox every month. The first of the month I do newsletter, full of news, full of links to things happening elsewhere. Um, subscribe to that, watch that, and you'll get a better idea of discounts because they're all in there already. Um, Nitin, I'm going to provide the project, but... Ooh! Treats for the dog, okay. No subscriptions at Alexander, okay, interesting. Um, Luna! This dog's getting exercise, running up and down those stairs again and again and again, because she runs downstairs to sleep for a while and wakes up for a treat. Is she going to come though, who knows? She does normally hear the bag, but it's a, it's a very big house. Let's find out. Um, questions in the meantime. Uh, will I provide the link? Yes, shortly. Once YouTube's processed the video and it's on available for replay and similar, I will uh, provide. Hello, Leah. Come on. I'll provide the link on GitHub. It's a GitHub Swift on Sundays. Come on. You could go. You're a good dog. Yes, you are. That is from Alexander. I'll put the source code for the project onto GitHub. Uh, not obviously Apple's horror, <laughs> but my own version. This thing here. They'll be in GitHub in like half an hour, so it'll be well, maybe an hour. Um, we'll see. Um, have I done edit multi peer connectivity? No, I haven't. Multi peer is brilliant. It's covered in hacking with Swift, um, but it requires multiple devices to work with. Uh, so, no, it's difficult to, to get that working on a live stream without causing problems. Um, blah, 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 blah. We're doing Q&A like Sean Allen. Sean's videos are awesome. Go and watch Sean's video. He's Sean Allen Dev on YouTube. Watch Sean, please. Um, I highly recommend it. This is my Q&A right now. I do a live stream with an application. You can now ask all the questions you want to, other stuff. It's your chance to ask that. I have no plans for dedicated Q&A stream. Right now, this is it. So go ahead and use it. When I think about using coordinators for a separate data source, I don't. Uh, not, they're not attached. That's like what I think about having automobiles for breakfast. It makes no sense. It's a nonsensical question. Um, coordinators and data sources don't go together. Um, any suggestions to pop in Swift? Um, yes, do it. <laughs> That's good. I like doing it. It's very clever, very useful, recommended. Go and use it. At what level do you call up an iOS June developer? Good question. I've written an article about that, which you may find useful. Um, if I look for, what's it called? Hacking with Swift. How to get a job, maybe? That's it. Something like this. I think this thing here outlines uh, my views on junior, senior, and similar, I think. Yeah, entry levels here, juniors here, uh, mid-level roles, and senior roles. Uh, that kind of goes into my details there, so go and read that article. It's called How to Get a Job as an iOS Developer, and read that. Um... Do I consider setting stuff to a second VC for an external screen as being close to wrecking single responsibility protocol? Well, you've got to pass it somehow. You know, this is not. I'm not making. I'm not making um, the first screen responsible for second screen. I'm not like modifying the output view directly. If I had said in my main view controller, uh, not dot text equals that, but dot output view dot attributed string whatever uh, is that, I would totally be breaking the single responsibility principle. I don't want to do that. I have to pass data at some point. It's got to go across. And I've done that in the most encapsulated way imaginable with a single exposed property that I can set, which handles as an observer the change to markdown. So I don't think that breaks anything. At some point, you have to pass data around, right? It's not It's not breaking responsibility. It's just passing data around. That doesn't change anything at all. 
Uh, yes, iOS is a beauty. You're right, Jeeper Luke, I agree. Marlon, do I recommend getting familiar with Apple's documentation? Is it recommended to do that while hacking with Swift? Um, Apple's documentation is incomplete and a bit hazy in places. Um, if you look up something like on my site, how, oops, Google, how to read Apple documentation, you might find my site. There we go, boom. Uh, this describes how to read it um, because it's complicated. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know many folks who actually go to this URL and look for things from there, sort of navigating from A to B to C. Most of us just Google stuff and go from there to the Apple application from there and work our way forward. Anyway, I've tried to write up how I read it, what extra information I get from the code comments and similar. Um, it's all subscribed in here. Um, I recommend at the very least you do keep one URL to hand, which is hackingwithstuff.com slash glossary, which is my list of common Swift terms to look through. If you're not sure what, say, the initializer is, boom, that's it right there. Um, so I recommend you use that at the very least. Um, I get the was. So Alexander, the problem is that um, I sell my books for 40 bucks, which is a lot cheaper than competition. You look at everyone else and they are usually more expensive than that. Um, and therefore, I get no revenue from updating books. They're all free of charge updates. I rely on selling new books. Uh, so I can understand why someone would want to subscribe because not only do they get the happy knowledge that they're supporting my work for the long term, which they are, they're helping me support me in producing new books and so forth, but also means I feel more comfortable adding new books to that. I don't really do right now. You know, I haven't written a new book now for six months because it's problematic. I've got to update that for Swift for lifetime for free. Um, so I've got to think, can I afford to do this? Can I afford to commit to this extra work to maintain this extra book? Because it's a breaking point. Only somebody I can actually update in a given time period between Swift updates and so forth. So it's problematic. So I can see why folks might want to subscribe. Uh, and it might end up costing more in the long run. But if it helps me write more books, helps support me to update those books more easily, then I can see why it helps everybody. WWC 19 predictions, Swift 6. No, we'll see Swift 5.1 almost certainly uh, at WWC 19. Uh, I expect we'll see two things. First, tabs. You know, we're going to see an actual screen system like you've seen right now, which is why I'm doing this project now ahead of time. So you have to do multi-screen apps more easily. I also think we're going to see, for real this time, Xcode source editor extensions. Uh, good ones. I think we're going to throw away the crap we have right now uh, and replace it with really good Alcatraz style, if you're an old school developer, uh, Xcode extensions. That's what I think is going to happen. Uh, we'll see in uh, two or three months, but I suspect we're going to see a significantly X improved Xcode system. Um, why is at unknown default into five different from default? The problem with default is it will automatically fall into all possible future situations, which is not really what you mean. You know, what you mean to say is, here's me covering all cases, and usually the other extra case you want to cover, that can be default. With at unknown default, you have to cover every case you know about individually, and have the at unknown meaning any future case they add in two weeks, two months, two years, whenever. And it's wonderful because it means that when they say, okay, there's a new device orientation, diagonal, whatever. Face up, face down, landscape portrait, diagonal. You haven't got to worry about adding that in the future. It'll be added to the at unknown, but you can catch it specifically as, I had no idea what to expect here, so here's a really, really safe default. Well, you're separate from default, because if with default, it'll just fall things into there automatically, which is not really what you want to say. It's got a different meaning semantically, so be careful with that. Um, ba -da -ba -bum. Do I see things like coordinates? So coordinates will be perfect here, realistically, because um, what you want to say ideally is this whole text view to change method, that shouldn't be there. That should be, realistically, hey coordinator, my text changed, that's it. I don't want to care about additional windows, first view, view controller, or split view controller, blah, 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 blah. I don't care about any of that nonsense. I just want to care about my text change and let the coordinator figure out the environment. Oh, there's an external screen. Oh, you're an iPad. Oh, you're an iPhone, whatever. And do the right thing at the coordinator level. 
That would be a much, much nicer way of, of doing that. So I recommend you do that. Uh, can I, uh, Rahul, can I say how to implement a tab RV controller? I've already done an article on that and done a video on that. There's not much more I can do. It's called something like Advanced Coordinators uh, in uh, Hacking with Swift and on YouTube. I go through tab bar controllers. Uh, I go through other things in there. Um, I'd use that for you, quite frankly. Naveen, how important Swift custom operators? Um, are you asking how important they are? I mean, quite important. I mean, I like them. <laughs> I mean, be careful, right? You you know, you need to make sure it has some sort of sense. For example, I might say um, I want to add a, a custom operator that multiplies ints and doubles because I'm sick of doing typecasting. That's fine. That's pretty clear. My int times my double returns double. Get that. Um, but if you had person type plus another person type, what does that yield? Is that like marriage? Is that like, you know, getting jiggy in bed? Is that like some hideous mutant monster? Um, you know, that kind of thing's more hairy. You know, what does it mean? Um, so I'll be careful how you use plusing and minusing and multiplying for custom types. Um, CG point times CG point. That makes sense. CG vector times CG vector. That makes sense. Um, other things, less so. So just be careful with it. Number one feature I'm looking forward to when I was searching from user perspective. I've got no idea. I've been asking folks uh, for things for years uh, and none of them been delivered yet, so <laughs> we'll see. And I think entirely from a developer perspective. I think about things that if I had this thing, so many apps would benefit. For example, if, if apps could do handwriting recognition, you know, the system has a built-in ML recognizer for handwriting. We just say, draw on the screen, what was drawn in there, please. Boom, get it out. I'd love that. I love an API to do weather. You know, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Because that kind of thing influences many, many apps. You could say, hey, I'm building a calendar app. You want a, a meeting on Thursday? Fine. Here's the weather forecast for that day and time. That's a quite a nice feature to have system-wide. Um, but it requires Apple to think that one through and license it and who knows what. Anyway. Uh, Robert, how am I storing data in Unwrap? It's a mix of JSON. Um, because uh, most of it's JSON. There's some HTML in there. Uh, how am I storing settings? It's all user defaults because it's uh, easy enough. Uh, Emre, how can I learn transition of data between multiple view controllers? Um, well, it's just passing the data, isn't it, really? I mean, I think I probably haven't asked on that, I expect. Let me just check. Um, pass data. There you are. <laughs> I mean, it's literally, you want to just look for it and you'll find it. Uh, there you go. How to pass data between view controllers. Oh, the dog's back again. I'm sorry, there have been no more super chats. Nothing. There's a treat that's there. But these people, they don't like you very much. So I'm sorry, there's no more dog treats. Sorry. Um, anyway, if you go to hackingwithstuff.com slash example dash code, you will find a big search box. Just type pass data into there and you get back how to pass data. Boom. Choose that. That's how you do it. So I recommend you read that. Taz, what is your computer? I have a MacBook Pro with a touch bar and hate it. Um, I'm hoping Apple will bump the iMac Pro at some point so I can get an iMac Pro because I am tired of this thing um, being slow and being noisy and have a terrible keyboard. So I'm hoping you get an iMac Pro at some point this year and I'll probably bump my MacBook Pro at the same time. I still use it. Obviously, I go to a lot of conferences and so forth. I still need a portable device I can work with um, so I have to get a new MacBook Pro as well. So if someone is going to get very rich from me, Apple, this year from new hardware if they announce new iMac Pro and if they announce new MacBook Pro. Matt, you're most welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it very much. So, Mongo, that's a good example of, of the confusion between that example. Is it a child? Is it marriage? Is it something else? We don't have no idea what it means. Um, so, uh, that's an example where uh, I would be very really careful with operator overloading. Uh, Marlon says, handwriting recognition, is that something that Evernote's feature, being able to search for words in photos, handwritten notes? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I, I don't use that. I type things into Evernote. I have loads of notes, each of which are a mile long of things to do, and totally um, bad at organizing it, so uh, <laughs> I've got no idea. Um, uh, Manjanath, any other language I code in? I code in almost anything I can. You know, just recently I've been doing obviously, obviously a lot of Swift, I've been doing Objective-C, uh, I've been doing um, PHP, I've been doing Python, 
Um, what else recently? I did some JS, but only about 100 lines or so. It's pretty small fry stuff. Um, but I, I do a variety of things. Before now, I've done, you know, stacks of C Sharp and stacks of uh, Delphi and other languages. But obviously these days, much less C Sharp, much less Delphi, mostly Swift. Robert, do I recommend the ultra wide to other monitors? Uh, uh, it's all right. It's a good screen. It's fine. It's super sharp. It's 5K. It's nice and big. It's wide color, nice and bright. The speakers are super annoying. They're not, they're, they're, they go from really quiet to really loud. It's like one button press, which really winds me up. Um, it's got Saxon USB-C connectivity. It has no USB-A, which is really annoying. Because I want to be able to say, you know, plug in some USB-A as well as USB-C. They could have had at least one USB-A back there to complement my Mac Pro. They didn't, which is very annoying. Again, I might Pro features that nicely, which is great. So it's quite good, the answer. Um, Ade, I'd love to be able to create custom watch faces. I agree. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Cracky, that, if they make that, that's the first thing I'd do is make a comedy watch face. Um, because why not? It'd be great fun. I'd love to do that. Um, so yes. Uh, Stephen, the Biggest advantage of Swift over other languages? That's a really hard question. Ooh, David's got some treat money. Let's take the thing out of the dog. Look at that. Um, that's a complicated question, Stephen. Um, certainly going back to other languages, you miss things like first class functions you get with closures. Good girl, come on. Good girl, yeah, good dog. You miss first class functions, you miss flat map and compact map, you miss, you know, tuples, you miss all these lovely features like generics that work really, really well. Um, so uh, it's annoying going by other languages now. Um, now Swift isn't perfect by a long way, we're still waiting for async await. I had hoped we'd see async await in Swift 6. It's now looking much more like Swift 8 or 9, or we see async await, which is a real shame um, so we'll see, but it'd be a long time if we see async await, which is a shame because it's gorgeous and C sharp and um, JavaScript. It's a lovely, lovely feature. I, lo I love it in those languages. I really miss it in Swift, so that'd be a, a nice thing to have eventually. Um, Alexander, maybe some objective C. Yeah, it's called Swift on Sundays, so uh, no. Uh, Naveen, you're trying to learn operators from this link, it's hard to learn. Um, I can recommend a book. It's called Pro Swift. Um, if you go to hackerswift.com slash store slash Pro Swift, this thing here teaches you operators in videos and text and so forth. We'll input a few and uh, see what you think. Recommended. Uh, what are my views on Flutter? I have literally no views on Flutter. I couldn't care less. It has no interest in me whatsoever. Uh, Google's got too much of a reputation for killing things after only a year or two. I have no faith it's going to last in the long term. Um, so yeah, I couldn't care less about Flutter. Right now, Swift is an extraordinary language. UI kit's really, really powerful. I am super happy where I am. Copperhead, what's async await? It's the ability to say you're declaring a function. I mean, I think the syntax, they haven't declared the syntax yet. But it's not like this. Um, func, some function does stuff, async, like that. And this keyword here means you can call this and it will do some asynchronous work. It won't block the thread when it's called. It'll go off and do some networking work, for example, or some slow work there. And you can now call that thing by saying, uh, let foo uh, equals await some function. What that means is, when it hits that line of code, it will spin off the work to require to call some function and stop the thread. It'll carry on doing work elsewhere. It won't lock up the UI at that point. It'll go ahead and call some function. It'll do some networking work. It'll do some yada, 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 return back to you the finished result, and then pick up on line 58 automatically. It's equivalent of having something like, you know, dispatch queue dot main dot async, blah, blah, blah. Except having, rather having things indented further and further and further with callback hell and all the capture lists and so forth, you just say directly, uh, async await. It's a much, much nicer way of working. Can any recommend the best book ever for Swift? I cannot be any clearer on this stream. If you want to learn Swift, you want to follow my 100 Days of Swift program. It's completely free online. 
There are stacks of videos. There's stacks of tests on there. There's even activities and little virtual chat windows and stuff to help you learn Swift and learn iOS all free online. I can't say any more than that. I am not going to say it again. <laughs> if you want to learn Swift, I recommend you go there. End of story. Any last questions? That is now 25 past seven. It's your last chance to uh, ask questions for the week ahead. I'm glad, Copperhead, you are enjoying the free resources. Um, and this is, you know, why folks buy my books. They buy my books, uh, and in doing so, they allow me to support the community. You know, someone asked me um, last week, I was speaking at a workshop in uh, Chester, in the north of England. Uh, you know, why do I give away so much for free? And I said at the time, hey, you know, this workshop I'm doing right now, I've traveled all the way up here, is free. I don't charge for doing workshops. Or if I do charge, like in that case, uh, I say, can you please give that away to diversity tickets so people can afford to come next year who otherwise wouldn't be able to come. Uh, and, you know, I do this work for free uh, on, you know, workshops or uh, hundreds of Swift or whatever because folks support my work. So really... It's all those people who are buying my books, supporting my work that way, recommending my books to other people, liking the videos, for example, um, who are enabling me to give away so much free stuff. So you want, if you want to thank anybody, you want to thank them because they're the ones supporting the site realistically. And this is why I think a subs model actually works. It's kind of like a Patreon almost. Um, if you want to continue supporting the work I do, awesome, um, you can do and know it's going towards a, a good event. What's the next Swift on Sundays topic, asked Robert? I don't know. So my goal is to write a book on Swift on Sundays. And I'll, I'll do it in chunks of 12. So the first 12 projects, which include this last one here, it's so number 12, will be available in a book form at some point in the future. I don't know when. Um, so you want to support the project, you can buy that book to have them all in neatly written up, detailed form with, of course, lifetime Swift updates there. Um, uh, and I haven't got a plan for the next one yet. It's going to be something... I want to start to diverge a little bit to applications, but we might look at, for example, tvOS or macOS or do another Vapor app or do watchOS or do AR kit or whatever. You know, we'll just branch out a little bit more, get some more unusual things here and there, just to reach out a little bit further than just doing more and more iOS apps. Uh, latest news in the conference. It is happening. It's totally happening. I am now inches away from announcing it. Uh, if you go to hackingswithcom slash live, you will hit the live homepage. And any day now, it's going to go out. As soon as I hear back the final news from App Camp for Girls, uh, it's a charity event, by the way. So all the money we generate from this, all the profit will go towards App Camp for Girls. We do wonderful work in the US providing camp experiences for girls uh, and gender non-conforming youth. Um, they have all the campfire fun, but they also learn to make apps, which is a wonderful experience uh, for kids. Um, so it's a charity event in the UK, July 8th and 9th. That's all confirmed. I pay for the event. I'm now waiting for the final, final sign-off from my accountant so I can launch ticket sales. I want to get it right. Obviously, I don't want to end up you know, hurting people with uh, money. So I get this exactly right, and um, it'll happen soon. So that's that event. Go and subscribe if you want to. You can add your email to the bottom here, and I'll email you personally when the thing goes out. Any recommendations on clean resource for Swift? There you are, a message here from Andy that will link to you, Clean Swift. Um, I don't use it, but, you know, fill your own boots. Uh, Tanscon, is it possible to take your own large title? Of course you can do that. You can just use preferred large titles equals true uh, in your navigation bar. David Lindsay, setting to purchase the book, read the current stream. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um... I do sell books. <laughs> um, I do sell books, obviously. That's how I make my money. Um, that's my full-time job, in fact. Um, so, yes, I, I need to get better at that. You know, I'm, I'm not a salesperson. Um, I am very much a developer who happens to like writing. Uh, I'm figuring out the marketing thing, figuring out the sales thing, figuring out the uh, advertising thing as I go. Realistically, um, the most important thing to me is folks recommending my work. If you, if you watch one of my talks or you come to a live stream or you enjoyed a book or you enjoyed an article, someone then sharing that on Twitter saying, I like this stream or this stream's happening or I like this video or I like this book, that's the best marketing I can have right now. So I'm really relying on folks like 
you coming here today. Uh, if you enjoyed the stream, if you learned something, if you had a good time, if you want to build into a real project, please tell other people. Uh, and in the meantime, yes, I might try and get better at marketing as well. Um, but right now, my main goal is to make folks like you happy and keep you learning Swift and keep you excited about Swift and recommending from there. So please do recommend this book to the world. Uh, recommend this books to the world and videos to the world would be great. Matsu, live emotion recognition. Um, yeah, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I, I have no plans for next week already. I tend to think of it about Thursday during the week. Um, so I have no plans just yet. Uh, Sandesh, no. No massive worries about Swift 5. If you go to my site, uh, what's new in Swift.com, you can choose your current Swift version, choose your target version, 5 or even 5.1 now added. And see here, all changes in Swift 5 with code examples you can look at really clearly and see exactly how they work. Um, and it's nearly entirely additive. Only a few little gotchas here and there that might trip you up. This is one of them. Uh, it's a lovely, really important change. You have one less optional in Swift 5, which is fantastic. Um, but broadly, it's all additional, so it's not going to hit you too much. Uh, in 5.1, there's some more great stuff coming. Go and browse through that if you really want to. So if you're on 5, go to 5.1. Uh, you get finally this universal self. It's taken me three years to implement that one. Um, this is a lovely little tweak again, additive stuff. Uh, that's also very nice. So again, it's mostly additive stuff. In fact, it's all additive stuff right now. So there's no real uh, corner cases to worry about just yet. Go check out the site, see what you think. And the best bit is that I love this. You can choose any version of stuff you like. Like I want to look at one and show me change it up to 5.1 and download all changes as an Xcode playground. So it'll walk you through exactly what's changed and why as Interactive Expo Playground between any versions you like. So that's the 1.0 to 5.1 to Playground. You could say give me a 2.0 to 4.0 Playground. That's that Playground. So it's something like 100 Playgrounds you can download with all possible variations between all versions of Swift. You can then browse through in Xcode and try them out live in Xcode to see what you think. So give that a try. I recommend it very highly. Um, Copperhead will definitely get a book for myself at some point in the future. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Please do. <laughs> I recommend that very highly. Uh, Lamin says, are you going to write a book at Marzipan? I don't know. It's not out yet. Um, I guess we're going to see um, what Apple actually announce. Uh, and I guess imminently they're going to announce something in two months' time saying, boom, it's here. Uh, I am tempted not to do a book about it because it's more about converting your existing iOS apps to macOS. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to see what they announce and... I mean, I'll be writing something for guaranteed, right? I always do every year. I publish, you know, what's new in iOS 12 or iOS 11 or iOS 10 or whatever. Um, that'll be in there for sure. Um, whether or not I do a whole book at Marsman, I don't know. We'll see what they announce in two months' time. I mean, I'll be there. I'll be in San Jose at Dub Dub. I'll be talking to them aggressively, <laughs> saying what happened, why, and I'll pass on as much as I can as fast as I can. Um, could I explain what ABI stability is and why it's a big deal? So realistically for us it's not a massive deal um as andy asked or said in the next question there's a two-part story between uh abi stability and module stability and they, they 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 seem so similar one is about can two pieces of compiled code from different versions of swift work together and the other is i have uncompiled swift here and compiled Swift here. How can they work together? So it's very, very similar problems. Um, I can see why Apple are pushing ahead with a 50-50 split. You know, their goal, realistically, is to use Swift. I mean, as uh, Objective C, I'm afraid, is going away imminently. It's got uh, no long-term future, realistically. Apple can't support it. It might be open source, perhaps. They can become uh, community supported. Swift is all the way forward from now from Apple, but they can't easily switch. You know, you may know at this point that nearly all of Apple is, is working on a bit of C, even today. You know, some parts, fine, have moved across, um, but the vast majority of existing code is a bit of C. Now, they want to change that ASAP, so they are pushing ahead ABI stability. So two pieces of code that have compiled can run side by side. So they can switch across to having, um, uh, you know, UI kit, for example, in theory, not going to happen, but in theory, UI kit was Swift. Our compiled app can talk to their compiled app on two different Swift compiled versions just fine. So that's their immediate priority get to ABI stability. 
and it means now that's shipped they are absolutely right now i feel confident saying pushing swift hard inside apple they probably, they probably have them six months or so like training folks up ready for the abi move but now it's there i suspect they're pushing very very hard for that uh, module stability matters significantly more for us to have com uncompiled code on our side talking to i don't know some library you really like alamo fire that's been compiled already for example or, or google analytics for example been compiled already that matters much more for us so that's coming in june apple will care of course they'll care not quite as much so they're not in a big rush about that so yes i suspect that'll land at dub dub um, in beta form which means final around september time i expect I mean, we'll see we'll know soon enough um, so it's a good idea for apple for us we don't really care let's face it uh steven do i have apps in the app store yes i do i have lots of the app store I've, I've taken most of them down but i still have some in the app store and they pay for my mortgage <laughs> I've, I've been lucky enough to hit a gold mine on the app store uh, and now it's actually maintained by somebody else can i make a tutorial where you make a code shredder animation on the app for a wallet app so um that's a real shame because the shredder's gone the shredder died in ios 7. Uh, it's one of my favorite if not my all-time favorite ios app uh, animation and it's gone you get a really boring sort of tv off effect now in the wallet when you delete passes which is a real shame it used to literally shred your passes and fly out um could i do that it's not really an app that's like you know when we, when we finish all the batches of apps i want to make we might start looking at techniques like animations for example right now though uh, another time um can i write a book or course on back ends like firebase or cloudkit um cloudkit already in hacking with swift you go to hackingswift.com slash read and then scroll down to like i think 33 or so boom this thing here is cloudkit and it actually builds an app i really wish someone would make and ship and make popular because i want to use this app um you record you whistling or you know laring or humming into your phone it pushes that to cloudkit and anyone who says you know, you know i want to recognize pop songs or reggae songs or blues songs whatever it is can download your audio recording and say oh that song is such and such because there are some songs you know you know the tune but you can't remember the name of it so it's really really hard to google and that app is designed to solve that problem using cloudkit so i've already covered cloudkit it's right there it's all free online to read um go and read that and please make the app i'd love to have the app there are some songs i'd love to find out what the heck they are and can't so please make the app Okay, that is now uh, 7.35. I'll give you another five minutes. Any last minute questions, go ahead and ask now. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter. I am Twitter Two Straws. Follow me there. Ask questions there. Uh, there is a Hacking with Swift Slack you can join. If you want to ask questions there, that's full of folks doing, say, um, 100 Days of Swift or similar. You can ask there if you want to. There's iOS channel, macOS channel, you know, bloody boots. Um, so you can hit me up on, on Twitter or talk to other folks on Slack. I don't really mind whatever works best for you. How do I remember code by head, by memory? Um, so when you're doing the 100 days of Swift, what you're doing is consistently is making applications from scratch because uh, that's the best way to learn. I mean, really, really learn is repetition. There's an old sort of um, story, I'm not sure it's real or not, um, about a class of children who are tasked with making pots, like pottery. A teacher says, okay, this first half, I want you to make the best pot you can. You've got a whole day, make the best possible pot you can. The second half of the class is gonna make as many pots as they can. Just make one, toss it away, make another one, toss it away, another one, toss it away. And so the story goes, at the end of the day, the class, the, the, the half of the class who were told to make the most pots ended up making the best pots, not the one who were tasked with making the best pot. Because they only had one go. They had one go, they had no chance to learn and throw it away and throw it away and throw it away. No chance to iterate. Whereas the other class had a go, that sucked, do it again, that sucked, that sucked, da, da, da. after 20 sucking, they finally nailed a good technique and they iterated on that again and again and again. And that's the core of the 100 Days of Swift curriculum. We'll make eight, 10, however many apps using table view controllers. And the first time you'll be saying, everything is new to me here. I've got no idea what any of this stuff does. 
Second time, oh, I vaguely remember this or this, but I've forgotten most of it. Fifth time, okay, I know this bit, I know this bit, I know this bit. In fact, um, Dan O'Leary, who's following along, tweeted recently for one of the projects, I think it was like 18 or uh, 17 or so, I think 17, said he could even predict what the homework was going to be based on what he covered so far. Because he's really getting into the groove of how things are working. And that's where I want you to get. So you feel so confident starting with a blank canvas. I want to make this app. How do I get there? You've done it five times already, 10 times already, 20 times already. You know the steps in your head ahead of time. And that's the power of repetition. Uh, so it's based around this pottery example. We're going to make so many table view apps, lots of collection view apps, lots of sprite kit games, lots of image views, lots of collection views and similar. Um, you're going to know it like the back of your hand. That's how you learn. It just takes time. I've been doing iOS for 10 years now. Of course I know it back the back of my hand. I've been doing it so long. But broadly speaking, it takes time and repetition to get there. So hopefully, follow along the, uh, the curriculum. You'll get there as well. Ooh, David Lindsay, thank you very much. I'm trying to attract the dog for your um, dog pleasure again. Luna. Let's find out she hears that. She's quite a hungry dog, you know, so I suspect she hears that. <laughs> Uh, do I have a Slack community? Yes, I do have a Slack community. Uh, I have a Slack workspace. Hello. Good news. David Lindsay likes you very much. You have a treat. You're a good dog. Yes, you are. You're a good dog. I do have a Slack. And I post the uh, invite link here repeatedly. And folks still claim they have never seen the invite link. I'll paste it again. And again, folks will ignore me. But I'll try again. <laughs> Let's paste it in there. Boom. That is the invite link for my Slack. Join that, join the Hash 100 channel on there, and you will feel uh, a safe place, hopefully, to ask questions all you want about the 100 Days of Swift. Uh, Lamin, I, I, I don't know how to set up accounts for doing um, Google stuff. That's a Google problem. I've got no idea. I suspect you press that little S dollar button thing, this thing here. You press that, and it might ask you a thousand questions about linking credit cards and stuff. I've got no idea. Um, I'm sorry, I really don't know. Okay, folks, your last chance for I sign off for the week. Um, hopefully, you're releasing the next 100 Days of Swift. I think, I think today's is day 66 or so. I hope so. <laughs> We're getting through it real fast, which is great. Yeah, today is day 66, launching shortly. Um, so, it's a consolidation day. A nice, easy one with some fresh challenges to take on. Uh, I know folks like doing. Uh, we're going live in half an hour or so. Alex, what are the physical connections for an external screen? I'm not sure what you mean. You mean on iPads, it's USB-C. So any sort of vaguely good USB-C screen um, will work correctly. Now, there's some really very frustrating slash annoying hiccups between um, Thunderbolt and DisplayPort and similar because um, they all like USB-C. So some screens will work great. My one does not work. My one's a 5K Thunderbolt, I think, which is not supported by iPad. So it's got to be a certain kind of screen to work yet. But obviously, they're working on that very quickly. And hopefully, they'll get better than the next iPad Pros to do more screens, which would be really nice. Uh, G. Paluk, can I recommend an article about best practices to make a significant redesign already published app? Uh, I'm not sure you mean by uh, redesign, but I do have... Uh, hacking with Swift, uh, modern apps, not like that. Uh, there we go. How to upgrade to modern app architecture. And in here, you'll see 
you have an existing app basically. How do you refactor add tests? How do you move across having Cocoa Pods? How do you add SwiftLint? How do you have Fastlane? How do you have GitHub? How do you add uh, online changes using Circle CI um, for an existing project? So if that's what you mean. How do you pull apart code, make it more modern and better? That's where you'd start. I do have another article on uh, massive view controllers like that. How to react massive view controllers, boom. And this is again is an example thing to work through, example project with a massive view controller thing. We walk through lots of ways to refactor that code so it's better um, and, and smaller. So I recommend that very much. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, Marlon, thank you very much. Let's see if I can get the dog back again. <laughs> this dog's gonna be so tired, running down the stairs all the time. Luna. Um what other bloggers do I recommend to learn Swift? So the, the number one blogger that I uh, look up to, um, admire, is absolutely Erica Sedun. Erica, Erica, for the amount of work she does, come on, Marlon likes you very much. This is from Marlon, there you go, good girl. For that work she does, the amount of contributions she gives to our community, both in terms of um, distributing information, vetting uh, evolution proposals, writing evolution proposals, she gets nowhere near enough credit. Ooh. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. How do you pronounce your name? I apologize very much. I'm not sure how you pronounce your name, Oystein. That's my best guess. Um, someone from Norway liked you very much as well. 22 Norwegian Krona gets you a treat. There you go, good girl. Um, Erica's amazing. And her blog is full of interesting quirks to look at. She's just so excited about Swift and teaching it. And of course, she's been around for a long time. You know, her books from iOS 5 and, and, and earlier, even before actually iOS shipped as a, a real hackable thing, she was teaching people to write code for it. There's no point staring at me, dog. You gotta wait for another person to help you out. Um, so ericasadun.com is a wonderful resource, and I'm actually looking forward to meeting her in July. She's at Swift Island in Norway, uh, Norway, Netherlands. So I, I finally get to thank her in person for working so hard for our community. So I'm looking for her, she's excellent. Uh, Erica Sadun. Erica sadun.com absolutely wonderful and so much information here it's a huge blog goes back for years and years and years and years uh, of information full of all sorts of things in here about swift and ios and his tvs stuff um putting paradigms duh, duh, duh. string delimiters swift 5 stuff uh api discussions and her book, Swift Style, is the de facto standard for Swift Style, Bundy. I mean, they're lo looking at you know, SE250 is about um, official Swift Style guide. And in my head, her book, Swift Style, is the de facto Swift Style guide. It's that good. Highly recommended book. It's a, it's a wonderful read. And, I, I, you know, it's changed the way I've written Swift to, ha to hold more of her style. So, epically highly recommended Okay, folks, that is now quarter to eight. I've answered as many questions as I can. It's almost an hour of question answering this time. I hope you go ahead and take this application and ship it for real. It's your code now. Do what you like. I love seeing people take my apps and ship them for real. Um, customize it. Make it better. Make it load and save files if you want to. I would love to see more of that. Uh, if you have any questions after this, by all means, grab me on Twitter. I'm Two Straws. Join the Slack channel there. Grab stuff there. Uh, I'm going to post this code to GitHub imminently next half hour or so uh, and I'll then post the um, 100 of Swift today, day 66 as well, it will go out shortly as well. So hopefully you'll see lots of me shortly, uh, otherwise I'll see you on Twitter. Thank you very much for coming, I'll, I'll see you all next week.